In a previous video, I discussed a concept for the ideal limpid ecosystem. Today, I want to take a step upwards from that loop to discuss the support role in Elite Dangerous in general, and how the game's current economic model renders player support an economically irrelevant role in the game. Economic relevance refers specifically to the place that a service fits in an economy. It can also refer to the lack of fitment which a service has compared to other options. A good real-world example of this is the transition from horses to cars that took place following the mechanical revolution. As a new, better solution became available, the old service became less desirable and competitive. It was eventually replaced. In Elite Dangerous, the economic relevance problem refers specifically to stations, which offer a service so vastly superior to what players can currently provide that there is no reason for any player to be considered if a station is even remotely accessible. Attacking this problem is actually quite difficult, as the issues surrounding ship repair and rearming aren't just a matter of adjusting repair times or adding complexity to the station repair mechanic. There was a time in Elite Dangerous where hull repairs were calculated at a higher base percentage of the hull's total value. It was possible to total your ship in an engagement and end up paying more in repair costs than the rebuy value of your hull and modules. This was hated in the game because it made combat gameplay extremely unforgiving, where limping back to the station with 10% hull would cost you more than dying in a combat area and respawning with a rebuy. When an economy punishes logical behavior, the result will be an illogical response. Players got around this problem by killing themselves after cashing in their bounty saving a large amount of, at the time, valuable credits by using one feature to defeat another. In doing so, engaging in an activity that was very immersion-breaking, and widely hated across the game. Why it was hated is far more important than the hatred itself. At the time this was going on, station repair was, and still is, the fastest way to accomplish ship repairs. The player repair tools on offer at the time were inadequate, and the base repair rates for ships were, and still are, the same at all stations across the entire bubble. This meant that there was no way for players to avoid the expenses related to hull damage, and no competition that might reward players with lower prices for traveling to different markets or providers for more favorable service rates. Elite Dangerous suffers from what is known as a cartel monopoly one created quite inadvertently by the game's economic model. Cartel monopolies are created when different providers in a market collude to fix prices, typically by agreeing to price their goods higher than a market's equilibrium price, or by agreeing to buy source materials used to make their products at a price lower than the market's equilibrium. In the real world, cartel monopolies are illegal. Competitors in most Western companies are actually forbidden from collaborating or coordinating their pricing models, under threat of an antitrust lawsuit orchestrated by their respective governments. For those who may be unfamiliar, antitrust lawsuits, if lost, can require the business to sell off components of their operating model, form new competitors, pay huge fines, fire executives, or take other actions which are generally intended to break apart monopolies in whatever form they take. The intention here is to ensure maximum competition, particularly in key commodities. In the United States, antitrust suits were famously lost by Standard Oil and Bell Telephone Company, resulting in these massive market monopolies being dissolved into several component businesses. You can look up the related Wikipedia articles on both companies if you want to know more about this. Both of these businesses were considered market monopolies, where one player gains enough market control to effectively dictate the prices. Cartel monopolies happen when multiple competitors in the same market form a unified block, achieving the same end result as a market monopoly, while allowing the individual players in the cartel to avoid being accused individually of being a market monopoly. Cartel monopolies can still be broken up with an antitrust suit, but proving that there has been collusion is often a challenge because these cartels often operate at a handshake deal level, no formal contracts, and often very limited email and communications trails which can be accessed and followed by investigators. 
in Elite Dangerous, this cartel monopoly takes the form of every station charging the same rates for repair, and it still exists now, though in a far less noticeable state due to the low base repair rates. This outcome was not some malicious plan on the part of Frontier to screw over players, although I think I've just built an excellent lore explanation for why the repair system in Elite works like it does. It would probably make for a compelling Galnet narrative if this issue ever gets addressed. The current problems with station repair are the direct result of the hybrid spreadsheet economic simulation, which underpins all of Elite Dangerous. Most commodities on the galactic market are driven by notional supply and demand volumes, which are housed and calculated by stations and settlements. Every station and settlement acts as a single node in the economy, providing the smallest unit of resolution possible in the simulation. To my current knowledge, the economic simulation is not physicalized in any way. Travel times, the risk of piracy, the number of interceptions or interdictions that take place, units of cargo, and all other aspects of the movement and consumption of goods happen on these spreadsheets in a server, if they happen at all. There's a small category of commodities in Elite Dangerous that are not subject to any form of spreadsheet. They are simply conjured into existence by the game whenever a player requests them, and sold at a fixed rate that does not change, or is minimally influenced by local factors. Limpets, hull plating, ammunition in all its forms, and AFM repair kits. Essentially, all ship consumables ignore supply and demand. Because of this, all the prices are fixed, and they remain the same at stations across the bubble. I don't know why this decision was made, and would like to, but whatever the intent, the end result of this decision was to create the problem that pissed everyone off in the first place. Which brings me back around to the start of this video, and the ideal support ecosystem. I've spent the last few minutes discussing economic theory to build the logical background for support mechanics because the game's economy is a core driving force behind making support ships relevant. The economy needs to regard ship consumables as commodities, and require them to be present at a station or inside a ship for these services to be available, and let their scarcity or abundance drive the prices players pay at stations for these services. The same resources should be required for carriers, and for players running in the support role, to be able to conduct repairs. In other words, having a repair limpet isn't enough. You should have both a repair limpet controller, the limpet required to execute the repairs, and raw hull plating in your cargo hold to be able to repair a target ship. When deployed, that repair limpet takes hull plating from your cargo hold and uses it fixing up the target. Once expended, the limpet returns for resupply and heads back out with fresh hull plating. The same process can be repeated for rearming a target ship through physicalized ammo commodities and repairing internal modules through AFMU repair kit commodities. The only change here would be the ability to bank and store additional shareable tons of repair kits, hull plating, and the various forms of ammunition in cargo, with each ton representing a fixed amount of ammo, hull points, or AFM repairs. The advantage of managing consumables like this is that different systems can then specialize in different things. Military economies can produce ammunition at extremely low cost, while industrial systems make hull plating, refinery systems make fuel, and technology systems make limpets. Players can visit and stock up on these resources in both ships and carriers, and then transport them to a system where scarcity is driving prices upwards. This would add a whole new dynamic to community goals and game events, where players congregate to a single system. In combat or war community goals, the local station is put under a higher overall load, providing large secondary demands for it to be resupplied of the essential resources required to sustain refuel, repair, and rearm services. Players could also, alternatively, provide direct services through their fleet carriers or their own ships, adjusting carrier tariffs to come in under the current going rate at stations. The system also provides another layer of logistics around carriers that choose to service players across the bubble, taking time to ensure key services are properly stocked with the consumables they need to serve the community. 
a steady flow of these services could be managed through the commodities market, and managed even better through player missions should that feature ever be considered, though that topic will need to be covered separately, as it ties into issues related to the ideal fleet carrier model, which I intend to cover separately. When paired with the mechanical changes detailed in the Ideal Limbit video, the changes that I go over here would vastly improve the available avenues of support and provide players with several avenues of specialization inside the support role, building ships that focus on doing one service really well with deeper reserves, or all three services more slowly, with reserves divided among each service. This role would provide ships normally used in combat trading with a much stronger value proposition while also providing additional incentives for players to form wings and provide protection for ships in this role. Deployment of support ships in combat environments would also provide an additional level of tactical planning, as having a ship with this capacity close at hand would increase combat endurance for all allied vessels, while at the same time creating a need for sustained supply lines composed of cargo ships ferrying consumable resources to support ships to enable them to remain on mission for longer. Counteracting support ships, and the vessels that supply them, would become an important component of conflict zones, as well as community goals, since hostile factions and pirates would have need for such craft. These suggestions would also provide a firm foundation that can be expanded upon should features like base building and player commodities manufacturing become part of the game at some point in the future. Physicalizing commodities also allows for the possibility of rare or exotic consumables, particularly in ammunition types, to be produced by certain economies. Allowing premium ammo to become something purchased or synthesized offers extra benefits for players willing to go to the extra effort to acquire them, both to sell or use themselves. It is my hope that these suggestions are of use to anyone at Frontier who happens to hear them, or to any aspiring game developer thinking of implementing feature sets like this on their own. If you think I missed something, or did not go deep enough, or even if you think I'm wrong, share your thoughts in the comments. That's all I've got for today. I'll catch you guys later.